Hello everyone. This is Błażej Kubiak. My name is Krzysztof Kudryński. And the difficult part of this presentation is already over. We will talk about our own technologies, which we implemented on the drone. And this presentation, if during this presentation you have any questions, please do not hesitate to continue listening and wait until the end of this presentation, where is the best time to answer questions. Uh, by the way, we are here until the end of this conference, so there's plenty of time to ask us questions afterwards. Okay, a few words about us. We are from TomTom Tom in Poland, where we deal with algorithmic design ranging from signal processing to artificial intelligence. And uh, the very interesting project that we are recently involved in is a self-driving car. So we are using our competence to in uh, image processing, video analysis, as well as laser point cloud analysis, GPS, INS positioning, to create a three-dimensional centimeter level accuracy a lane level map for a self-driving car available at global scale. Now, uh, this map is paired with the model of surroundings, which we use for localization, and we also create some algorithms for automatic detection of various uh, road features to make it quick, the production. But the most interesting part uh, is the localization. This is a road DNA, a set of two depth maps to both sides of the road. This is our invention, which lets the car ideally uh, position itself on the map. So when the car goes, it can compare what it sees with what is in the map, and we have the precise position, which GPS is not enough. So on a daily basis, we are working on the car to drive itself safely and comfortably. But the problem with the cars is that they don't fly. And we think that flying is awesome. Everybody wants to get high. So today, we will talk about flying. And the agenda for this presentation is very simple. First, we will talk shortly about a short project, and then we'll talk a bit more about a long project. It all started with a competition in our company where the aim was to follow a running person with a flying drone and film it. Uh, the finals took place in Amsterdam, which is a city so famous for the fact that you can absolutely legally visit windmills. <laughs> there is no sound, I think. There should be sound. So, by the way, the vision of flying was growing strong in us. Uh, we expected this to be a story of pure success, the story of conquering the skies, the story of flying into the unknown and reaching the stars. And we were almost right. We were almost right. This was a story about fighting, the story about constant irritation, the story about struggling, about constant falling and rising from your knees. The story about determination and desperation. <laughs> we are professionals. And as professionals, you all know you need to have a certain plan of your actions. You start by the drone, open the box, learn to fly manually, gather some characteristic, and then continue with incremental development, test, uh, develop. You all know that. But at the same time, we are enthusiasts. And as enthusiasts, we started with a final design. And then we bought all the electronics that came into our head, and then we bought the drone. We quickly rushed with the development, and it was going really great. After celebrating the first successful versions of our code, we finally decided to open the box. The drone was inside, so we put all the electronics there, 
and we gloriously went for our first test in the field, which turned out to be the last test of our first drone. With the next drone, we decided to learn to fly manually. <laughs> and then we continued with almost professional approach. Uh, so our system was based on the Parrot Air Drone, uh, with which you can communicate easily using Wi-Fi. Uh, and there's a plenty of open source in the web, which you can download easily. What we used is Yadrone, um, a framework which you can download for free under Apache license, so you can use it. And it promised easy control over the drone, which turned out to be true. There's like uh, one function which, in fact, we used. It is a move function where you just set the angles for the drone and the speed, uh, and some listeners to, to listen to the drone state. It's in Java. It is 100%, and it is pure. It also supports Android, this time maybe not 100% and not pure, and without the video, but we managed somehow to do it. Uh, Boazhe will later uh, tell you a little bit about that. Uh, but anyway, the system consisted of a drone, which was supposed to uh, follow and film the runner, and the runner with the mobile phone in his pocket, which from the point of the view of the system was just a mobile phone. Uh, the task was for the drone to follow the phone, so uh, we needed to find the localization, and both of these devices had GPS, so the first rough estimation of position was done by GPS, and then a better distance was found using Bluetooth iBeacon, and finally, a better angle of view was found using image processing, tracking of the person in the frame. So with this, we had a quite precise localization between the two, and from the application in the phone, we could send the commands to the drone to turn and to accelerate, so that we will find ourselves in a nice, suitable place to make the video of the running person. So uh, the application, in fact, is just the, the system is just the mobile phone application which listens to the drone state over Wi-Fi, compares its state with own state of the telephone, and sends back some commands to the drone to follow it. Another part of this uh, application is the safety officer application, which is another mobile phone, external person, which is able to kidnap the drone in case it wants to kill the runner. We learn a lot about security here. This is a question of life and death. So, we are enthusiasts of graphical user interface. It needs to be beautiful and simple. There was no time for both, so we chose just beautiful. <laughs> there are some buttons for manual control and the button to start the autonomous mode. If, uh, for those of you who are a bit disappointed by this design, there's fortunately a safety officer application which looks much better. Beautiful or not, our system worked. Uh, well, our enthusiasm and also lack of skills in dealing with this flying piece of hardware costed us lives of free drones, one injury, and countless losses in equipment. But with the last remaining drone, we managed to follow the runner on its entire track, which was a reasonable achievement. However, we don't like reasonable achievements. We want extraordinary achievements. So, with the junk of the free drones, we created the drone of the last chance. The new hope to fulfill our sick ambitions. These ambitions and uh, the agenda for the following presentation is to create a technology to make the map from the drone bottom camera, localize the drone in this map, and then use this map for high-level orders, uh, high orders uh, for the drone in context of very nice applications like 
please bring me my glass of water. Thank you. Uh, we approached all of these issues and we will present that with some details in our algorithm, uh, algorithms, but focusing mostly on the show. So during the first few weeks, we managed to get undistorted video from the drone bottom camera, and we put some books on the floor in our office, and we're flying the drone over these books to get some frames. And now these frames were the input to our simple Java application, which you can see here. So what you can do, you can browse through all of the frames. If you find the frame useful, you add it to the map, and you continue browsing, as you can see. Using blending, you can see the map below. You can rotate, zoom in, zoom, zoom out, shift, so that you can manually find the best fit and continue browsing. So with that, we created a beautiful map. Well, not very beautiful. Uh, so we were working on making it more smooth. So we're working on blending the frames into the uh, map so that it will look better and better. How we achieved that? Well, this is the, uh, the diagram of the drone flying over some high objects. Uh, the dots show the places in which the frame was taken. And each picture captures a limited angle view of what it sees below, and it is not aware of the height of the objects below. In fact, it is inconsistent with any other frame which is taken by from other uh, angle. The only place which is consistent with the top view is, in fact, the place that the drone looks just down, which is the center. Usually, if we drive smoo uh, fly smoothly, it is a center pixel of our image. So what we did, we create a mask, which is one in the middle, and it goes smoothly towards the edges. So now, when we want to combine two frames, when we want to add a frame to the map, we simply perform weighted averaging with weights taken from the mask. That's, why, that's how we create a blended frame, and then we accumulate the mask, and whenever we want another frame, we want to add another frame, we can do it freely with the accumulated mask and continue with this process. So this way, we were able to create a nice and smooth map, map manually, but it was taking a lot of time. So we wanted to automate that, and in order to do that, we created uh, a brute force algorithm first, so we were, when we had some frame already, we would be looking for the next frame in some reasonable neighborhood, but for all the possible shifts, all the possible uh, rot zooms and rotations. So you can calculate that if we assume that during one second a drone can move three meters, it can rotate by 90 degrees and change altitude by one meter, uh, this would mean that for uh, a pixel um, resolution of our map, we would need hundreds of thousands of operations per one uh, frame, which would be, for working in real time, millions of operations per second, which for working in real time is exactly too many. Uh, of course, you can do go down with this number quite easily with simple tricks, but if you really want the real-time operation, you need to choose wisely these places where you want to correlate, and even then, you need to correlate fast. How to be wise, I will tell you later. Now, Boazhe will tell you how to be fast. Hello. Hello, everyone. So, as Christoph said, I'm going to tell you how to be fast. So my goal was to develop a fast method to localize frame captured by drone camera in the map that has been created continuously while drone is flying. So we need to uh, consider many possible locations when which, which could be correct for particular frame in the map. And uh, we need to do it very fast, so to achieve real-time performance of around 2,000 uh, considered location per second. And uh, the confidence that we assign to each situation must be smooth, which means that when we the, the frame is going away from the correct position, it should uh, decrease smoothly. And it should increase when we come back. That's it. So. We started with a very simple solution based on template matching. <coughs> this is basically summing uh, product 
uh, of pixel values in overlapping area between frame and map. So it's quite simple, but unfortunately, it's not fast. So we achieved only 100 locations per second. So we did another try. We wanted to be smart this time. So uh, we would like to avoid processing whole frames, all frame pixels, and we process only edges, uh, creating, uh, so, so we use edge-based distance. Uh, this kind of distance, the idea behind this is very simple. We need to detect edges in the map, detect edges in frame, and check how close they are. So we're just iterating over pixels, uh, edge pixels in frame, and, and summing distance to the closest edge in the map. So only question here is how to calculate distance between particular pixel and the closest edge efficiently. And fortunately, the answer is also simple. We need to pre-calculate all possible distances for all edge pixels, creating edge, uh, edge distance map. So in that map, at each pixel, we know what is the distance to the closest edge uh, in, the, in the map. So when we put the frame over the map, uh, we can just iterate over pixels of edge pixels in frame, just reading precalculated values that are lying behind in the map. So it's, it's simple and it looks promising for our goal. So this map is created in linear time and it is created only once and reused for all possible considered locations. So it should be fast. So let's see if it is indeed. So we've performed around 3,000 transformations per second, and it was quite enough for our, uh, our application. And obviously, it was much faster than template matching. So now we know how to localize fast. But fortunately, with the Adron uh, framework, we didn't have video. So we had to add it. Uh, we wanted to have the video either in uh, Android application, also in uh, desktop application. So we used FFmpeg library in, on, both, uh, on both platforms. Uh, for Android, there is a nice tutorial how to um, compile FFmpeg and how to use it. On, for Windows, we found uh, pre-built binaries. So we just connected to video stream uh, over network uh, in, on, on the drone. Um, and we just render frame and also use capture frames for our video processing. But unfortunately, we, when we capture uh, frames, we saw that there are distortions. And these distortions could spoil our creation process. So we wanted to remove this. To remove distortions, we need to use some uh, correction equations. Some of them are for ballet distortions, some for this tangential distortions. And uh, to use them, we need to find a few parameters. And finding this parameter is called camera calibration. After calibrating camera, we also get focal length of the camera, which is used to have um, metric resolution of the map, which will be used later. Um, so that's it. I won't uh, show more details. Let's calibrate our camera. So we take a few pictures of uh, calibration chessboard. We find corners using some nice uh, OpenCV uh, function. And we try to make straight things straight. So straightness is objective function for calibrating camera. So after that, let's see our example. Uh, frame and, and another frame in overlapping part uh, fits much better. And with another example, we see the same. OK, so now Christoph will tell you how to make wise choices. So <coughs> we have limited the time per each coloration, now it's time to limit the number of correlations. And I told you that we, in the brute force algorithm, we were considering all the possible shifts of the, from the one frame to the other, another, which we don't need to do. 
because we know from the drone sensors something about the drone movement. So instead of using all of the possible places, let's use the sensors to say more or less when the drone might be, and only for these locations apply the quick correlation. However simple it might sound, there is a huge theory behind that, and it's called probabilistic robotics, and it needs over 600 pages for brief introduction, and I'm not going to tell you this brief introduction now. Instead, I'm going to tell you a story. From one point, this will be a story about the beautiful piece of machinery which we used. It's called particle filtering. On the other hand, this might be a story which could happen to you, to me, to anyone else. And for the reasons that will later become clear, we will call it the hangover. So let's imagine this day when you wake up and you don't know where you are and you don't know what happened yesterday. And you are trying to think where you might be now. You are yet too afraid to open your eyes, but in your imagination, you are trying to spot all the places that you might probably be in. And your first belief about your state is not satisfactory for you, so you finally find the courage to open your eyes and make your first observation. It's the beach, so probably it must have been nice yesterday. But with this observation, you are already able to update your belief about your state because you are not drifting in the ocean. You must be somewhere at the coast or maybe on the, near the lakeside or maybe a big river. So this is some, there's probability now only in these dots where such observation is possible. Other places, the probability is zero. So you decide to start to walk. And you are walking for, I don't know, one hour, two hours, and what you still see is the beach, which means that you are no longer possible to be on the lakeside or in the small river. You must be on the coast, so you update your belief. And then you start to walk more and more, and you are able to make another observation. You see two soldiers guarding your passage, and you immediately know you are on the border. So the places not on the border have the probability zero now, while on the border the probability is very high. But the guys are very unfriendly, they have guns, so you turn around and you walk with the sea on your right hand side and you walk for some time and you see a tourist. And finally you are able to make your final observation. You look at him closely and you know immediately that you are in Poland. <laughs> so, what was happening here? We had some state, we had some position, velocity, we didn't know exactly where we are. In fact, we didn't know anything about what, what we had, and we wanted to know, we wanted to know where we are. What we had was some previous belief about our state. Maybe it was totally random, we didn't know anything. Maybe it was already crystallized, and we presented that as a collection of dots, spots, where we might probably be in. So a lot of hypotheses that were, were in our head. What we also had was our control. We were moving, we were turning around, maybe we were counting our steps, we were thinking how long we are going. And this measurement, we were applying to all of the hypotheses, all of the particles that we might be in, creating the new belief about our state, created by our movement. And then for each particle in this belief, we were comparing how probable this might be in comparison to what we see, to what we measure. So we had the control to move our previous belief to the current state, and then the measurement to check the probability in each of these spots. And these probabilities, which were high because of the measurement, were stayed in our belief, and others were turned to very small probability, and they were no longer present in the next. So this is a very simple explanation of what the particle filtering is. In fact, we could talk about this for hours, but I will just tell you a few nice properties of that. Uh, 
In other approaches for that, usually you are constrained with some limited distribution, for example, Gaussian, which only gives you one uh, hypothesis. While in particle filtering, thanks to the particles, you can model whatever distribution of probability that you want. There are some problems with that, but this is very flexible in the case you might consider different hypotheses. Also, it is nicely scalable. If you are on the mobile phone, you can use only a few particles of course, you will longer achieve the nice, uh, precise solution. But if you have a big processor, or maybe multi-threading or whatever, multi-processor machine, then you can use a lot of particles, and you will achieve the solution faster. And there is a nice recovery mechanism. So if, by any means, your uh, sensor was wrong, and you lost the place where you are, and only other places left, there is always possibility to create some random particles all around, and finally you will find, uh, you will hit this place where you are, and it will uh, generate particles there so that you, you know you are there. So this is a very nice mechanism, and implementing that is not a challenge. It's quite easy, in fact. What is a challenge is the design of the state and modeling of noise. Our model, our state for the drone, was its position, its velocity, its rotation, and zoom. Obviously, the control was the accelerometers in the drone and the change in rotation and height read, read from sensors. And finally, the measurement was the frame and its correlation with the map. So, although now, after this presentation, most of that might seem obvious, but, in fact, the control is not so obvious. Acceleration, well, you can just read it from the sensors. Easy, yes? No. I will tell you why. The drone is controlled by angle. So, when you move the drone backwards, when you bend it backwards, it will start to gain acceleration forward, and it will start moving in the forward direction. However, if you compare the acceleration that you get from the sensors, with the ground truth that you measure somehow externally, like making photos and making, I don't know, with the ruler, you will see that it has no sense, absolutely. This is totally different. And it obviously has no sense, because what we want to measure is the acceleration in x and y direction, while what we measure using accelerometers is the acceleration in the drone reference system. But now, come on. You have this angle, sorry. This is pitch and roll. You have this in the sensor. So it should be just a question of simple trigonometry. It should be so easy. But the gravity is there. And it is huge. And even the smallest error in the pitch and roll sensor, sorry, I don't know why it's, okay. even the smallest error in the pitch and roll sensor would make the gravity leak into the horizontal axis, and the results would be terrible. And in fact, it turns out that the pitch and roll sensor in this drone are very cheap, and they suffer from significant error. So in order to correct that, we were flying, hovering in one state for some seconds. Since we were hovering in one state, the pitch and roll should be zero mean. It was not zero mean, so this is how we find the drift. We could calculate it, subtract it, and without a drift, it looked much better. So we could use this de-drifted pitch and roll to finally correct our acceleration. The problem is that in this drone, the acceleration sensor is very cheap, and it suffers from significant error. So what we had to do, we had to use the level of acceleration in the buffer to calculate the drift of the acceleration, subtract it to get the re-leveled acceleration, and then, as you can see, it looked much better. Of course, there is still some statistical error here. Uh, it looks much better as a shape, but statistically, there is still quite significant error. You can see it's up to half a meter per square second, which is not so little. Also, there is a lag between what you see in the camera 
and what you get from the sensors. And lags are killers for particle filtering. It is even better to say we don't know the acceleration than to say we have the acceleration measured and underestimate this uncertainty. So if you are in a such situation that you are afraid that you will underestimate something, exaggerate it. That's what we did, and it worked. Another uh, discussion would be needed how we dealt with uh, orientation and going from ultrasound sensor to scale, and how we dealt with degradation of noise when going from acceleration to, to position. But uh, there's a lot of literature about that. You, you can read that this is not so interesting. There is not enough time to, to talk a lot about our system architecture for um, flying the drone, visualization, getting the logs, and so on. Um, I think some of you might be a little bit disappointed. Some of you might not even believe this, but we didn't use microservices. <laughs> what we used was plain Java, a few threads, and a state machine, and it was working really nice. What's very interesting about that is that behind the control interfaces, we have the real drone implementation to go into the field, fly, gather data, uh, try how it works in the field. But under the same interfaces, we have a simulator uh, implementation, which uses the pre-recorded videos and sensor values to replay the flights offline. This is very nice if any one of you dealt with debugging of applications working on hardware and in real time, this is a nightmare. And such application made it possible, reproducible, and fast. OK. You know our tools, our algorithms. Now you know our inspiration. Let's show how it works in action. So this is a video of our drone in action. In the bottom right, you can see the keyboard layout for controlling the drone. In the bottom up, you can see the external camera, which is filming the event. But this is just for presentation purposes, but synchronized. And in the middle right, you can see what the drone sees. This is, will be the frames which will be used to create the map, which will appear on the left. It's black because we are in calibration state. When it appears, it will be a bit stretched because we don't use uh, aspect ratio here. It's just whatever. OK, you can see. So we can see now the red dots are the particle no particles, so our no position uh, hypothesis. We are flying, and we are revealing the terrain, the fog of war, while we go into the enemy territory in our office. As you can see, while we are flying over the same places again, they changed because of the blending in the map. Whenever we find a better perspective on that, thanks to blending, we are uh, updating it. Now in the upper right corner, you see uh, the, this camera filming the event, but it will switch to the front camera of the drone in a second, just for fun. And you see our friends working in the office after 10 PM. We got spotted. We hide behind the wall. They were here illegally after 10 p.m. We had the permission to stay in the office for the whole night. A romantic night. Me, Boaje, and the drone. <laughs> OK, we continue our mission. And now we will f this will be very interesting. We will fly over this uh, desk. And you can see the update, because now we are more over it, which means we have a better top view perspective than before. So thanks to this blending, it gets updated. So this is basically how it works. It was our main aim. We are very happy about this. This was our free time project. So we were, yeah, this works finally. But this was not the end. We had the map. We know where we are on the map. So let's tell the map where we want to go and stop controlling the drone. Let the map control the drone. It knows where the drone is. It knows where it's going. It knows where we want to go, because we specified the target. 
So let the map calculate the controls of the drone so that we go closer to our target. We did this, and the test for that, OK, we didn't know exactly our position. Yes, We had our particle filters. Uh, so we could apply it to every particle and calculate the resultant. This is what we did. And in, the, in this mission, the drone will wake up not knowing where it is. It will localize itself using particle filtering because it has the map and it sees what it sees. And then it will go to target one, the green one. It will pick up the cargo, go to target two, and land with the cargo. The, this is a feasibility, so only thing that is not uh, working here automatically is the pickup mission. This was done manually. So when we go to target two, a person will take the, over the control and will pick up the cargo. And then, uh, again, automation. So this is the next video. You will see some lag between the camera, because we use the different camera here. Uh, but nevertheless, it will be uh, nice. So we are calibrating. In, in a second, you will see the particle filtering. Uh, it will gradually, quite quickly, but gradually go into the place. When it finally has enough confidence, the map will take over the control over the drone. And it will fly. Yes, it is starting to fly towards with uh, a bit of lag. But it is flying towards target one. We are almost there. Yes, and now the manual takeover. Uh, by the way, the technology for the pickup is the magnet hanging on a sticky tape. And sometimes the magnet goes into pendulum motion and it obstructs the view of the height sensor, of the ultrasound sensor, which means that the drone sometimes misjudges how high it is. You will see it later, how the dr drone uh, works with that. It will be very interesting, but now let's focus on the pickup mission, which you have to believe me, need a lot of patience. OK. Yes, I think we are ready. That's the pickup. Yes, 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 yes. Now, that's the misjudgment. But we are flying towards target two. We are landing. We are landing. We <laughs> conclusions. <laughs> we broke the glass. We broke the drone, and we displaced the ceiling. <laughs> but we managed to localize ourselves. We went to target one. We picked up the cargo. We went to target two, and maybe not in the right place and not too smoothly, but we delivered the cargo to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so however simple or however hard this might sound to you, but Reading the title of the presentation, you might probably expect it, what, what was going on here. What we are going to show you now is totally unexpected. Because what we'll show you now is the toilet idea. If you don't know, the toilet idea is when you go to the toilet and you have an idea. Our toilet idea was about blending, however that sounds. <laughs> so I told you before that we use a center perspective for every picture, apply it to every frame, and we have a top view map because of that. That's a very nice approach. It made the map nice and smooth. However, what? if we apply a different perspective. Apply it to every frame and create a layer from that map and then save it and create such layer for every possible 
perspective that we think of. What we would have, we would have the map from different perspectives, and we would be able to play with that. In the simplest case, if we go infinitely far away, it means we use only the center perspective because we are infinitely far away, so we have the top view. So this is exactly the thing we were talking about up to now. We will create a top view map. But if we zoom in, we are starting to use all of the different perspectives at that point, not only point view, but top view, but also the side views. We zoom in and we create a virtual view blending all the possible perspectives. So, like the right side will be blended from frames which saw this place on the right side, left side will be taken from the left, and finally we'll create a virtual view in this place. Notice that the drone was never here. This is purely virtual view. We implemented that. The, there was a small problem, because to make it work, it would need precise localization. Particle filtering, which we designed, would need a lot of development to make it so precise, a lot of trials. We didn't have too much time for that. Also, it was very sensitive to pitch and roll, but we at least wanted to prove the feasibility of our approach. So, we moved our toilet idea to the kitchen. And in the kitchen, we prepared professional laboratory setup to make manual photos of the floor, which consisted of the ribbon over the scene. This ribbon was supposed to give us reference height and pitch and roll to take manual photos. So this will be a manual project. Manual photos of what we see below. This ribbon is hanging over the scene, attached at one side to the kettle and on the other side to the microwave oven supported by milk. <laughs> with such laboratory setup, we prepared 11 layers with the center layer and extreme layers you can see on the slide. Now, with the standard map, while zooming in, you will never know that below this chair there is a Spider-Man magazine, which you can clearly see while zooming in with our 3D map browser giving you the perspectives about which the drone has never even dreamed. Zooming in, browsing the map is available in 3D in our browser. This is not very smooth yet, but this is something that we are quite happy. Because there are a lot of uh, 3D reconstruction algorithms available in, in literature. There is structure from motion. There is image segmentation, recreation, modeling. These are a lot of sophisticated methods. In our approach, we use no image processing at all. Just simple image blending. And to our knowledge, no one has ever done this before. That's why we are happy. So, to conclude that, during this session we are talking how we did some implementations of our own technologies on the drone to make it possible for autonomous follow-up, mapping, localization, and map-based control, all available in 3D for selected regions. Now, I hope this, is, uh, this will be very useful for you, especially for those of you over and ent enthusiastic about the hardware project. Yeah, we will do it. Let it be the discouragement. But for those of you freaks, let it be motivation. If two no-name people can do this, you can do it. For us, it was hard work, and we are quite tired. But considering these moments, when we felt pure creation, it was worth it. Thank you very much.
Any questions? Well, we are here for, we have still some, some minutes left, so if you want to come down, there's no problem. I, I, I see nothing, so if there is any question, you, you have to speak loud or, or come down here, yeah? What Spider-Man comic was this one? Sorry? What Spider-Man comic book was this one? <laughs> I don't know. I will have to ask my, uh, my son.